Okay. Well, it's nice to meet both of you and thank you very much for being available and willing to join the Real Truth About Health Conference. Glad to be here. Uh, yes. <clears throat> you know, I, uh, on some level, <clears throat> I like some other panels better than this, and I'll tell you why. Um, Dr. Esselstein says you can be heart attack proof. I love it. I feel like I have so much control. Just follow a whole food plant-based diet, and I don't have to worry about that. Other people talk about you follow a plant-based diet, and you never worry about diabetes. Amazing. You don't smoke cigarettes. You don't have to worry about lung disease. This is all amazing. But chronic kidney disease, I, I wish that word would just go away. I want to. There's enough things to worry about. And when I look up the statistics, it's not like 1%. I see crazy numbers. Like I, I'm looking at it and thinking, am I saying, is it saying that 15% have it? Who even knows what it is? No one even talks about it outside the medical world. So I kind of just want this all to go away. I, I don't want to take another thing on our plate. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping that you're going to tell us that it's not as out of control as it sounds and that actually we have some influence um, over kidney health. But um, I don't know, there's not as many books written about it. So maybe you could just each tell us what you've been doing for the last 15 years and what we need to know about chronic kidney disease. And then I'll go into more specific questions. Sure. Um, do you want to go first, Dr. Hosmi, or you want me to? Okay. Um, well, you're absolutely right. I um, So I started in kidney disease in 1998, straight out of school, which is not something you could do today. You have to work for a year as a dietitian before you can go into um, kidney disease. But I did, and um, I started in a dialysis center. And over the years, I kept seeing, I'm in, I'm in the South, obviously, by my accent, um, in just south of Memphis, Tennessee, I kept seeing dialysis centers go up like a Walgreens on every corner. And I began to ask the question, why in the world are we not doing something about this? Just like you said, Stephen. And so um, when I was doing my master's work, I started just doing more research and started looking at what they were doing in Europe. And they were putting patients, um, instead of just watching a patient fall dialysis, Every three months, go to their doctor appointment and they just fall forward to dialysis. They were actually putting patients on low protein or very low protein diets and supplementing those back with keto analogs. Uh, so I started just trying that with patients. We didn't have keto analogs at that time. This was back in 2012. We do now. Um, but I just began trying it with patients. And it was amazing that their GFRs got better and better. Um as far as I'm a plant-based dietitian as well. So when I started in dialysis, I began to think, um, it, back then I thought, well, plant-based nutrition and kidney disease really don't go together, but actually they do. And the more research that comes out, um, even in dialysis, even in dialysis, patients can still eat a plant-based diet. And there is research showing that they are um, have great numbers and are healthy. But um, in the pre and stage population, eating a low protein plant-based diet will slow progression. But also, you can't, I, I try to say, don't just, I tell my patients, don't just think of yourself as, as kidneys. You know, even with everything that Dr. Es Dr. Esselson did, most kidney patients die of cardiovascular disease, of heart disease. So at, all these things go together because there's so many comorbidities that go along with kidney disease. So, um, you know, yes, there's absolutely something that we can do, but we do have to raise awareness. People have to know what kidney disease is. Quit refer them to a dietitian, refer your patients to get help nutritionally, which is not happening. It's a little bit better with value-based care companies coming into play. Um, but, and, and just sound the alarm to patients out there that, hey, if you're a diabetic or you're hypertensive, get your urine checked to even know you have kidney disease. And if you have kidney disease, get to a renal dietitian or a doctor who knows about nutrition immediately and get help because we can slow progression. We can keep people off dialysis and there is hope. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Jen, for, uh, for giving that great overview. You know, um, Steve, you, you started by saying something very interesting, which was the statistic is around 15% of the people out there have kidney disease. But let me give you a different statistic. Same information. Nine out of 10 people who have kidney disease don't know they have kidney disease. That's a really important statistic to remember because more so than the statistics you have, 
I would argue that the idea of one in seven having chronic kidney disease, there's actually much worse statistics. It's just that most people never get it checked. Number two is for everybody who's in the field or not in the field, kidneys are very complex to understand. And because they're complex, most people don't really grasp how they function. You know, when you're born, you're born with about a million kidney cells, what we call nephrons in each kidney. And the only thing that happens to them, and this sounds like doom and gloom, but the only thing that happens to them as you get older is they die. And so part of part of there's a little bit of an echo. Part of life is really figuring out what are those things that are going to cause that to accelerate. We're all going to age. There's all sorts of changes that are going to happen. If you look at my pictures, I had a full set of hair. I don't. That's part of it. <laughs> but part of understanding that is what are those three things that are going to cause your kidneys to accelerate that decline faster than anything else? It's diabetes, it's blood pressure, and it's weight. That's it. That's literally it. If you were to look at all of the speakers that you've had so far on your show and talk about all of the things that they're talking about, whether it's heart disease, whether it's cancer, whether it's lifestyle, no matter how you look at it, everyone is saying exactly the same thing. And it comes to exactly those three things. Now, the reason kidney nutrition becomes so darn important is because we, we meaning the collective nephrologist, dietitians, social workers, and the entire field has gotten the idea of looking at nutrition as very black and white. And the problem with looking at things black and white is you miss everything because life is all gray. That's why I'm wearing gray. Total joke. But the idea behind nutrition is, is we have these very set criteria that if you are somebody with kidney disease, you need to cut out potassium. If you're somebody with kidney disease, you have to go to a protein diet that's going to be very, very low, except for what is the ideal type of protein. When you go on somebody who's on dialysis, we think of people on dialysis as that's it. You failed. Now you're on dialysis. In fact, it couldn't be the opposite. The data shows that on dialysis, your risk of dying in five years is 50%. Or another way to say that is when you look at your dialysis unit out of five chairs, one of those chairs is going to be empty by the end of the year because they died. And so part of that is, is not just in kidney disease, but in dialysis, there is so much that you can do to lower your risk of not just death, but disability, and to improve the quality of your life. So for me, I've been in this field for quite some time now, and I can tell you, a lot has changed in terms of the options for medications, but a lot of the simpler stuff of just making better choices and having people feel like they're in control, we've taken the control away from them. We talk about heart disease and we talk about all these beautiful things that we can reverse heart disease and we can do all that stuff. But there's nobody out there who's saying that if you have kidney disease, that number one, it's not a death sentence. And number two, that there is hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So based on your real world experience of real people that come to you, what works to eliminate um, high blood glucose so to make people not diabetic and not of high blood pressure and not of be overweight you know what is the you know we've different people speaking on diet but what have you actually found is the most effective way to prevent diabetes high blood pressure and being overweight i'm gonna say i mean that's very <clears throat> okay i'm gonna say individuality like being individualized don't just um like Dr. Hosme said everyone's different it's not just a blanket kind of diet or plan it kind of depends on where people are come from coming from what's causing their problems um you know most most people who have kidney disease are diabetic and hypertensive those are the two main causes of kidney disease however there are many genetic conditions also that um can cause kidneys to be damaged and so we have to take all that into play um, but you know, if you, it's, it's like he, Dr. Hoshman was just saying, it, it's all kind of the same thing, you know, a whole overall, if you had to just give an overall like blanket guideline, a whole food sticking with whole foods, um, mostly plants, high fiber. Um, but then when it comes with kidney disease, there's so many 
nuances that you have to look at. You, you know, and, and I'm grateful. So K Doki is something that's like the national guidelines for kidney disease. I'm so grateful that they changed it because they changed those like with potassium, with phosphorus, as you go by the patient's lab. So we have to, the, the biggest thing that needs to happen is more patient. We need to catch kidney disease. We actually need to test people and catch it earlier. Um, because like you said, nine out of 10 people don't even know they have it. And then get them to somebody who can individualize a plan for that person um, according to their unique state, their stage of kidney disease, their level of potassium and phosphorus, culturally, what do they eat? Um, all those things come into play. Yeah, that's that's an excellent answer. You know, the only thing I would add to that is as, as you think about where we're headed, when I, I'm sure this is the same thing for Jen as well. You know, when I got into medicine, at that point in time, plant-based diets weren't sort of in flavor. And then we saw this whole tidal wave happen where now everybody knows that to use the word plant-based is this hip thing and it's really cool and all the cool kids in high school are doing it. But this is where the trouble lies. There's a healthy plant-based and there's an unhealthy plant-based. And so for folks like myself, you know, when we talk about what is the ideal diet to eat for kidney disease, we're talking about minimally processed whole foods is what we're encouraging people to eat. We're actually trying to shift a little bit away from using the term plant-based diets because of the fact that there's a lot of really highly processed plant-based foods that are now on the market. And for patients, they're so excited, they come to me. So I'm a kidney specialist and an obesity medicine specialist, and I have both practices. And the challenge that I see is patients are desperate to do the right thing. They're looking and every single time they either look at YouTube, they look at social media, there's some guru out there who's saying, eat this and you're going to fix everything. And then they turn around and there's another guru out there who's eat this and you're going to fix everything. And at the end of that, it becomes very, very difficult if you're just somebody who's got limited income coming in, who maybe have three, four people whose mouths you got to feed every day, and you're working 10, 12 hours to figure out, okay, what do I really do? Now I see a sign that says, this is a plant-based food. I think I'm doing good. I went to a fast food restaurant because that's all I can afford. I picked the thing that says, it was going to be plant-based. So part of the challenge we have is there's a cultural shift. And what we're really trying to get people to do is realize the basics are the basics. And the basics are still some of the best options we have. So in kidney disease, the fact that sleep makes such an important part of this, and you want to be able to encourage patients to get seven to nine hours of sleep, to get that sleep hygiene going, to get that regimen going, we underplay the impact of just five to 10 minutes of walking, if, if you make a mistake and you eat something bad, listen, go out for a quick walk, right? Nobody's perfect. We're not going to fault you to say, oh my God, you made that mistake. Instead, what we're going to say is nine out of 10 times, you did so great. And when you do fall down, don't stay down, stand back up and make a better decision to do that. So exercise makes such a difference. When we look at the, the concept of connection, of social connection, most of our folks who are going through illnesses, unfortunately, they're battling it alone. And as healthcare providers, what we do is we come into their lives for 10 minutes, for 15 minutes, every three months, and then we go out of their lives. But what we forget is, is that the 99.9% .9 of the time, they may be battling alone. They may not have any resources. So there's this idea of social isolation. And how do you get over that? How do you bring people together? How do you create relationships and foster? Because what we know is that when you're stressed, you resort to whatever is the easiest and weakest part of you. So for some people, when they're stressed, they go and smoke. Some people, when they're stressed, they go and do whatever the junk food is. And then for food-wise, what we talk about is quality. Quality of food matters. You know, if you're getting food and you're trying to do the right thing, what we want to be able to do is not shame you, but instead support you by trying to make it easier. How do you take very simple, very inexpensive things, put them together to make a healthy meal for your family? So when we talk about the main causes of kidney disease, we know that main causes wise, they're preventable, even when we start to get into things that are genetic. There's so much that you can do to slow down that course. So if there's anything that your listeners tonight can take home is 
Number one, don't lose hope. Number two is don't go for the hype. Don't let people tell you that you're going to get this magical answer. But look at the part of how do you make progress over perfection. And if you mess up, it's okay. And ignore everybody on Instagram who's saying, you know, I did X and I'm now 200 pounds lighter, or I did Y and I cured my kidney disease. Instagram does not share our failures. It doesn't. Nobody goes there to say, today, I messed up. Tomorrow, I still messed up. And the day after, I still messed up. Because if you did that, you wouldn't get followers from it. So part of this is there's a reality of it. There's compassion to this. There's caring to this. And it's all about that human connection that we all need to emphasize over the idea of my way is somehow better than the next guy's way. Because all of that stuff means nothing to the member. Absolutely nothing. So out of the last thousand patients that you have seen, what percent of them had chronic kidney disease, but didn't have diabetes or obesity? I don't know that percentage, Dr. Hosman, you may. I just guess. don't, just a guess, like how often does that happen? Yeah, so the majority of my practice is diabetes is obesity, it's high blood pressure. And so if I had to, you know, make a educated guess based on the last 14 years of doing this, I would say probably a good 80% of my patients have preventable causes. And then 20% that are left over are the ones where we're doing biopsies, we're looking for genetic causes, we're looking for other things, where it's a very different pathway. But a good 80% is where I know that if I can get those folks to just stand next to me and see where they're at in life, we can make so much work, so much change. Yeah, my dad yeah, died. I would, if I had to just pull a number, I mean, that's kind of a hard number, hard thing to answer. But yes, I mean, most of, things like the genetic conditions are considered rare disease. So um, <clears throat> the primary cause is diabetes and hypertension. And, you know, along with that usually goes obesity. Um, so... Um, but like Dr. Hosmi said, no matter what, there's still hope for, for whatever the cause is, there is still hope. Um, and another thing I really like that I think we need to, to bring when he was talking about like community and needing help, it's also important that, um, especially if you're, if you're working with the dietitian, like kind of ongoing coaching. So I have patients that, um, you know, they know they've learned what to do. Like we've taught them what to do, but they still need, maybe they don't have a social structure. They still need, sometimes they just need me just to talk to me once a week, you know, just to be their support, to encourage, to be that voice that hears them um, and, and helps them with things maybe that they struggled with. And so I, I would encourage that, that ongoing coaching. Um, sometimes that can be unaffordable. Um, and at that point, you know, finding community resources, um, social workers can help with that sort of thing, just finding some sort of support group, a church, anything just to have something to kind of hold you up as you're walking through this, because it's hard. Chronic disease is hard. And, you know, a lot of times, like with other chronic diseases, going back to how we started, you know, with, say, cancer and people go through cancer treatment, they say, oh, you're in remission. Okay. With kidney disease, you're really, it's something you have to stay on top of forever. So you need an ongoing support system. You need ongoing social surroundings to, to help you keep, get you up when, when you get down, because it is, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to deal with. Um, and so I, I love to encourage my patients to have community and, um, you know, it, it's not just diet, just exercise. There's so many other things, just being a whole human who happens to have kidney damage. Yeah, when my my dad passed away about four years ago with, from chronic kidney disease, and every now and then I would butt in to the, with the doctors and my family and suggest something about diet, and everyone yelled at me and told me to, you know, don't get out of the way, Stephen, you're being ridiculous. But is this not, is you, what you're saying not considered known uh, about how diet and lifestyle affects kidney disease? Is this um, secret information or did the most kidney specialists know this? In my experience, no, they do not. I mean, 
Um, <clears throat> so that's the whole, so I, I wrote the first, I actually just published a second book. I wrote the first book, Plant Fed Kidneys, because I felt like I need to raise awareness People are not aware that nutritionally you can do something to slow progression. Um, and then patients read it. It was really more for practitioners trying to raise awareness. So I wrote a second one that just came out called Plant Fed Kidneys for the Patient because patients wanted recipes and more support. But that's the reason I wrote that. And that's the reason I do a lot of public speaking. Um, a lot of the nephrologists, they still, even if they're in, say, a and, and value-based care is, is trying to change this. It's, it's trying to make the pre-end stage, the pre-dialysis space more multidisciplinary. Even there, nephrologists aren't referring to dietitians. And I don't understand why. They're not all like Dr. Hashmi or Dr. Shivam Joshi from New York. Um, they're one, those are wonderful, but there's a lot. We still need more education. We still need to talk to doctors so that they know. And we need to educate patients as well. But I'll be honest, I think the patients are ahead of the doctors, and that is why they're out on Instagram looking. They're searching. That I hardly ever have to go hunting for patients. They find me. Um, and so I think you know our medical, our medical teams need to get up to speed, and let's start helping these patients avoid that dialysis chair. Okay. There was a book that came out by just recently, and I think in the last you know, few months called by Sally Norton uh, called Toxic Superfoods, How Oxalate Overlaid is Making You Sick um, uh, and How to Get Better. She says that beans, quinoa, and whole grains are gut irritating foods and um, green vegetables. Uh, okay, so yeah, and, and green vegetables. So could are oxalates bad for our kidneys? Could we get ourselves in trouble by having too many green vegetables or too many whole food plant-based? Is this something to be concerned about? I don't want kidney stones. I don't want kidney disease. What do you make of this? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> it's it's funny that you bring up this topic because, you know, when, when we start to talk about things like beans are going to kill you and, and oxalates are going to kill you, there are entire continents that should frankly be dead if you truly believe in this idea. And this is fascinating, right? If you talk about kidney stones, the first thing we do in kidney stones, there's actually very simple things you have to do. Let's take calcium oxalate, most common type of kidney stone. You don't put them on a low oxalate diet. <laughs> and these are calcium oxalate stones. So the first thing you actually do is you tell them that as you're eating vegetables, fruits, etc., you want to pick products that are actually going to have higher content of calcium in them. You don't want them to take calcium supplements, but you actually want to increase calcium rich foods. And the reason you do that is the calcium that goes inside your gut will actually bind to the oxalate. And then you'll get rid of it when you go to the bathroom. You know, preventing kidney stones is water, water, water. That's the number one way, because at the end of the day, if you look at a stream versus a pond, how does a kidney stone form? It forms because debris collects and then it turns into a stone. If you don't want debris to collect, don't let it sit there. And how do you not let it sit there? Keep drinking water and keep having the flow. The problem with fear is whenever you come from the angle of fear mongering, you can actually scare people into all sorts of things that are not reality. You can tell them the earth is flat and people are likely to look outside their house and say, oh, you know what? Ah, he's probably right. The earth is flat. I'm going to fall off the cliff if I walk too far. People will believe it. And this is where whenever we start to talk to extremes, we just need to take a step back and start to look at this research. For the longest time, when it came to nutrition and kidney disease, Part of the issue was nobody really had any data. We had some quote unquote population based trials, but we really didn't have any randomized control studies. Guess what? We have plenty of randomized control studies when it comes into the field of kidney disease. Now, even in dialysis, we're coming up with these randomized studies where we're showing even crazy things where nephrologists back in the day, when we talked about intradialytic exercise, people were like, oh my God, you're telling people to exercise while they're on dialysis, they're going to die. And guys like me were saying, they're going to die if they don't exercise. And now you have a captive audience for three hours. What an amazing thing. Yet we have data on that. So the beauty of what we're talking about here is we want to be evidence-based. We want to make sure that we can back up what we say with data that is well-designed, that's replicated. 
any person can publish a study. Science is never built on a study. Science is built on the idea that you do a study in this continent, I do a study in this continent, somebody else does a study on a completely different population. The more times we start to see similar results, the closer we get to the idea that this is true. We never say in science that something is 100% true because we can't. Science is built on the idea of replicating people's works. Nowadays, the dilemma that we face is folks are publishing studies, whether it's an industry group or anybody else, they will publish a study. And then you will have folks in social media who will say, yes, there's a study that says X, Y, and Z is going to cure this. Okay, so there's one study. Now, show me what the issues are. How many people did they pick? Was it blinded? Was it double blinded? Was it randomized? Who's the sponsor? Is it replicated? What are all of those variables? And then we can actually come to some kind of an answer around this. So this fear-mongering idea that people are doing around certain foods are going to kill you, I should already be dead because I eat a lot of lentils, a lot of lentils. Um. How do you prevent getting kidney cancer? I'm gonna let Dr. Hashmi take that one. Sure. sure, so, you know, cancer is one of those things that a lot of times it's not something that we did wrong. Whether you're talking kidney cancer or you're talking lung cancer, this is not just people who are smoking or colon cancer. There are so many other things that can go into it. There's environmental exposure that you could be eating everything right, but you're living next to a freeway and getting exposure all the time. And that's what's causing it. So when it comes to kidney cancer, there's a lot of things we don't understand why. The good news about kidney cancer is, is it can be caught. It can be treated. We have very good treatments for it. And unlike all sorts of other cancers that can be a lot more severe, kidney cancer does not have to be a death sentence. Once again, medicine, you know, Sometimes we have physicians, and I think, you know, Jen will agree, we also have dietitians in the same camp where they're either all nutrition and all this, and they're anti-medicine, or they're all medicine, and they don't want anything to do with nutrition. What my philosophy has always been is to be like Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan's thing was he would look at all of these guys and say, what's the best I can learn from this person and take it? And then he would put the time into training. If you want to be really good, you want to look at the best of everything, bring it all in. And at the end of the day, we're in the business of saving lives. We're not in the business of making ourselves look good. So wherever we can get help, whether it's from medicine, whether it's from anything else going on, we want to bring it, including the idea of social connection. So that's where kidney cancer there's so many causes. And I wish I could say it's because, you know, somebody ate burgers and that's why they cause it. No, it's not like that. There are so many different reasons for why it can happen. And I would still tell you to put the burger down. Um, what did yeah, I would say with that too, you know, a lot of times, um, Again, going back to kind of the Instagram, you know, people say, oh, if you'll, if you'll just eat totally plant-based, you'll never get cancer and all, but there is, there are so many things. Um, I actually, my husband actually got cancer and we lead a very healthy lifestyle, but it was from an environmental toxicant that he was exposed to. And so I think sometimes people will blame themselves. They'll say, it must've been something I did wrong. And that's not always the case. So I would just encourage you not to go down that road if, if you do end up with kidney cancer. Hey, what advice would you be giving differently to someone who you're trying to tell them how to prevent kidney cancer for someone who, I'm sorry, someone who you're trying to give advice to who's trying to prevent chronic kidney disease versus someone who already has chronic kidney disease? So if I've asked you a bunch of questions so far about how do we prevent this, now if someone comes to you who already has it, what's different about the advice you would give them? Um, well, it depends on what stage they're in. So if they are early, so, so kidney disease is in stages. It's one, two, three, four, five, and then 5D dialysis. Or, and it's in three is broken up into three A, three B. Okay, and so as you go down that line, um, 
everything changes. And again, it's going to be individualized to every person. But if you're in an earlier stage of chronic kidney disease, um, I would just encourage basically healthy lifestyle, whole food, plant-based, um, not junk vegan, um, exercise, sleep, community, all those things. As we get further down, that's where I begin <clears throat> to really, really dig in with my patients. I say, listen, we are a team. We have got to avoid this dialysis chair. Are you with me? And if they're with me, then I say, okay. And we'll look if they are really late stage, but still have some function and are not on dialysis yet, then we, depending on where they are, this is not a blanket statement because it's, again, it's going to be individualized, but sometimes we'll put them on a very low protein diet and supplement back with keto analogs. Those are, those are amino acids that don't have nitrogen. So they don't produce waste. Also, they'll scavenge nitrogen from other protein breakdown um, to, to prevent even further waste from, from going through the kidneys. So I'll take that route. Um, again, that will be, you know, where are they financially? Can they afford it? You know, if not, then we have to figure something else out. We figure it out. Um, if they are on dialysis, that is very hard. And then that depends also on the type of dialysis, because there's a lot of different ways that people can do dialysis. But if they're on dialysis, at that point, you really have to become an encourager. Um, that's a that's a hard life. And um, you know, if they're on in center hemodialysis, patients they go they go to the dialysis center three times a week for three to five hours. They sit. And so I encouraged my patients to be the healthiest dialysis patient that you can possibly be. A lot of them would say to me, Jennifer, I did this to myself. I'm sitting here because I did it to myself. I'm like, that's fine, that's the past. Let's move forward. What can we do now? So when we talk about dialysis, uh, exercise in the dialysis center, I did that. I went and I bought peddlers out of my own pocket. I wrote a protocol, sent it all the way up my dialysis company because that I thought it was that important for people to move instead of just sitting for three to five hours. I encouraged them to move even when they are at home. Um, <clears throat> I encouraged them, you know, the, the traditional historical dialysis diet is just void of fiber, void of nutrients. That has got to change. Um, it still lingers on, even though the KDP guidelines have changed. But, um, <clears throat> you know, eat whole healthy foods. Think of yourself as a whole person. And then another really interesting thing for a dialysis patient is <clears throat> encourage them, teach one, and encourage that one to teach their peers. People like to hear from someone that's like them. And so they love, dialysis patients will sit in the lobby and discuss things. And so if you can get some encouragers that say, hey, I love cauliflower and this is how I eat it, um, and then encourage other people to eat healthy foods like that, then you begin to see changes in that dialysis center. So it really depends. It, kidney patients, you know, a lot, a lot of times we like to lump them all into, into one bucket. Even a transplant is going to be totally different than a dialysis. It's going to be totally different than a pre-end stage. And then pre-end stage is going to be totally different from what stage of kidney disease they're in. Um, so there's a lot of nuances to that. But um, again, going back to that hope, there's hope to avoid dialysis. But even if you're on dialysis, there's hope to live past that five years. If you take care of yourself, you can live past that five years. I've had patients that have been on for 20 years. So um, just encouraging them to be the best they can possibly be at whatever stage of kidney disease they find themselves in. And should we be doing, is regular exercise enough or should we be doing a breathing exercise like yoga? Um, well, again, that depends on the patient, but they can do regular exercise. The one thing, and they can do both. The one thing to be careful of is, you know, do they, do they have a heart condition? Um, also the access arm. So if they are on hemodialysis, they will have an access in one of their arms. That's how we, um, get to their blood to clean it. That's There's needles that go there and it goes through the dialysis machine and we clean their blood that way. And so they have to be careful if they're doing strength training or something like that, um, you know, to be careful with that arm. Of course, always get cleared by their doctor first um, for any kind of limitations or restrictions. But, you know, I mean, I had patients, there are dialysis patients. What was, there was a, um, oh gosh, I can't remember his name. Dr. Hashmi, you may remember his name that used to speak all the time. He ran marathons. He was an dialysis patient that ran marathons. And he spoke to other dialysis patients saying, hey, don't quit living. And so, you know, I think it depends on the patient. I'm not telling you to go out and run a marathon if you're a dialysis patient, but if you can, and if you're cleared, 
do it, live your life, be as healthy as you can possibly be. That's excellent. Let me go back to your first question, Steve, in terms of how the advice changes. So in our clinical practice, you know, when patients first come to us, it's incredibly important that we focus on some of the basics. You got to make sure that you understand where uremic toxins are going to come from, and they come from your gut microbiome. So what you eat is going to translate into the type of toxins you produce. You're constantly doing this, and a lot of the stuff that you create, whether it's autoimmune conditions, or it's inflammation, or it's other things such as uremic toxins affecting different aspects of your body, is starting from the food you eat and how it interacts. And this is why when people are on a predominantly meat diet, they have a lot more inflammation that's going on inside their bodies. And as they switch over, it takes time. How much time? On the order of months going on. So when you first meet a patient, even if let's say there's somebody who's got a GFR above 60 and they don't have any protein in the urine, which by definition means they don't have kidney disease, but what's their blood pressure? Because let's say your blood pressure is 130 over 80. You may say, well, you know what? That's a great blood pressure. But what does that mean in terms of the blood pressure that's going inside your kidneys? We call it intraglomerular hypertension. So in other words, we can have patients whose blood pressure systemically is okay, but they still have higher blood pressures. What are telltale signs? If you have extra weight, especially if you have extra weight around your trunk area, that's creating pressure, mechanical pressure directly on the kidneys. That's an opportunity to work directly on the patient to make sure they realize what is that impact going on. So we're very aggressive in terms of making sure the blood pressures are excellent. Food is an excellent way to do that, especially as you go towards whole foods. When you look at things like salt, salt is critical. People eat so much sodium upwards to about five grams of sodium every single day without even realizing it. One fast food meal, you're getting 1500 milligrams without even blinking easily. So when we talk about getting the sodium content down, it's incredibly important, no matter where you are. And as your kidney disease progresses, we double down even more on these recommendations. Earlier on, the higher your potassium intake, the lower your blood pressure ends up going. We have really good data to support this. How do you get more potassium? You eat more fruits and vegetables going on. So as you're going through that spectrum, what we want to focus on is what's the quality of your food? How's that going? Now, if you get to the point where your potassium clearance is not good, we'll make the adjustment. But up until that point, we're not going to tell you to start restricting just because the book says, you can't have X, Y, and Z. That's a mistake going on. Phosphorus, we start to talk about phosphorus when you don't have kidney disease, when you have very early kidney disease, and even if your phosphorus is normal. Why? Because the number one reason that people die with kidney disease is not because of kidney disease. They die because of their heart. And we know that when we do x-rays on these folks or we do any kind of scans, they light up like a Christmas tree. There are so many vascular calcifications that are happening. And phosphorus, especially inorganic phosphorus, is such a simple thing. Get rid of the processed foods. And as you start to get rid of the worst kinds of phosphorus out of your diet, you're setting themselves up for success going on. So there are all of these things that start the first time you meet them and they go down. And this is why you got to have a knowledgeable dietitian on your team because you don't want to wait till their CKD stage five, and now they're going to go on dialysis. And now they should go see a dietitian for the first time. This is not the time. You should have done that when they first came and saw you to start this whole journey. You know, fiber is so important because fiber is your prebiotic going on. It's going to feed the healthy bacteria. So if you want to reduce uremic toxins from going into your gut, you want to get more fiber in your diet. How much do you want to get? 40 grams a day. You know, when, when folks who know me, I always joke about folks who are so obsessed with the paleo diet. And I always tell people, I love the paleo diet, just not the one that gets printed in the books. If you look at the studies, on average, our ancestors were getting close to 100 grams of fiber a day, 100. That's the original paleo diet. It wasn't that they were so good at hunting with their saber tooth claws that they used to be able to get animals and all this stuff. We weren't that good at that. The first civilizations came around water. Why? Because they needed water to live. And two was the kind of hunting they were doing was they were getting fish. 
That's about the extent of the hunting. But the majority of the foods they were getting was a ton of fiber, and they had the GI tracts to be able to tolerate it. So we want lots and lots of fiber early on and as they progress. Even when they get on dialysis, we want more fiber because it reduces the production of uremic toxins. We can't even measure all the uremic toxins. We measure things like precrestal sulfate and doxyl sulfate. Those are just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many toxins that are being produced. So at the top, we start. And then as it goes down, we double down on the strength of that advice. And the only flips that happen is certain things like potassium to the point where the clearance goes down. Um, I've taken, when I've listened to speakers speak before, I've taken it very seriously when they said not to eat animal products and not to eat sugar. But I've taken salt kind of light, like, well, salt in my flax crackers doesn't count and salt in the you know whole foods guacamole doesn't count and it's in my olives. So can you, in terms of chronic kidney disease, can you tell, talk to us about salt? Yeah, it's very simple. I'll give you a very simple example. How would you like to make your medications for kidney disease twice as effective? Cut down salt. If you have protein in the urine and I give you an ACE inhibitor, if I give you an ACE inhibitor and then you eat the typical standard American diet or the SAD diet, you're going to spill X amount of protein, it'll go down. But if you do the same ACE inhibitor, ARBs, whatever, and you cut down your salt, you'll see that the studies show you can improve that number by 50% more. How crazy is that? How crazy is it that the diet portion will make the medicine more effective? So once again, this is not diet or medication. This is, I just want to figure out what is the best for you and give you the best opportunity. And what's the number one predictor of how fast your kidney disease is going to go down is the amount of protein you spill in the urine. So we need to fix the protein in the urine. That's one of the biggest things we're after. And how cool is that? That a simple thing like cutting back salt can actually do that. And salt is in every type of food. You know, it's a funny thing. People are like, but don't you need salt to survive? Of course you do. But aside from my few patients where, who have like SIADH, where I actually need to give them salt tabs, which is like one out of like 300 patients, every patient that I see, if they were to say, I'm going to take zero salt in my diet, if they were to tell me that, they would still get plenty of salt in their diet. They would never be in a situation in America where they would be worried about not having enough salt in their diet. Um, and if I juice celery, is there any chance I could get too much salt from that or that that's okay because it's from a celery? Jen, do you want to, since this is uh, your, so first of all, what, what, I, don't Go know, ahead. I, I don't know what's up with people and juicing. You know, I, I got to tell you, like this whole juicing thing, it just, it bugs me, right? So you let nature spend millions of years trying to craft the perfect food for you. And then you just ruin it all. You leave all the fiber of the celery behind. And all you get is basically water. No, you're not going to get salt overdose with it. But what you are going to get is essentially nothing, right? Eat the celery. The celery is nature intended you to eat the celery, eat the celery. You know, it's funny, I was um, busy eating carrots. I love carrots because they're great. But, you know, my kids are always like, we want carrot juice. I'm like, how'd you get this? How'd you get into this idea? Now, I don't force them to go my way. But I can tell you this whole juicing concept is the worst idea ever. In fact, here's something that most people don't understand. You know, my other hat is obesity <clears throat> medicine. The number one way for people to gain weight is through taking liquid calories. When we do bariatric surgery, we literally take their stomach, we take this large stomach, we turn it into this little tiny stomach, which is sleeve, or we do a bypass where we bypass a portion of their small intestine. So we call that a ruin Y gastric bypass. Do you know how people overcome both of those surgeries? They drink their calories instead of chew their calories. So this concept of juicing, I have still have no idea how I can come up with any redeeming qualities for it. 
If you yeah, would- and going back to sodium, you know, I mean, I think a lot of times people miss the forest for the trees. Like people are not getting too much salt from celery juice across the board. It's just not happening. They're getting too much salt from eating out, um, <clears throat> from eating things like processed packaged foods and um, canned foods. So really they need to become a master at reading labels, um, which dietitians can help you with. Um, so <clears throat> if you're looking at a label, just quick tips, always look at the serving size. Because it may say, you know, only 400 milligrams of sodium per serving, and there's four servings in there. So that's a lot of sodium. Also, um, one rule of thumb is just try to keep it at 200 milligrams of, or less per serving if you're reading a label. That's a good rule of thumb. If you're eating out, a whole lot of times the salt is in either the, the dressing, like the salad dressing, or the sauce. Ask for those on the side. Um, you can even, if you're eating at a, like a restaurant, you can ask them to make your food with less salt. Now at fast food, there's a problem with that because a lot of that food comes almost like pre-prepared in a sense, fast food is all, but just heating it up. They cannot change the, uh, how much salt is in there. It's what's in there is in there. So another good reason we ought to not be eating fast food, except for on a very rare, rare basis, if at all. But um, if you're eating out at a restaurant, you do have some control. Take that control. Ask your food, to, ask for them to make your food with less salt. Ask to have seasoning, I mean, sauces and salad dressings on the side. But most importantly, cook at home. So one thing that I run into is people say, I hear this all the time, I don't cook. Okay, we got to change that. So that's why in my second book, I made every recipe five ingredients or less. Anybody can do that, okay? Um, People, I think a lot of times nowadays, people don't cook because all the recipes online have 30 different ingredients. You can't pronounce half of them. You don't know where to get them. And they tell a big story before the recipe and you have to click this button that says jump to recipe. And people are like, forget it, forget it. So keep things simple when you cook and you'll be, and it'll be much more enjoyable. Anybody can follow instructions, especially if they're simple instructions. That's all a recipe is, is instructions. Um, and then why not? You know, it's a great way to spend your time, especially as a family, bringing families back around the table. What a great way to spend your time cooking for your family and spending time together. Um, what would that do for us in America? I think it would do a lot. So, and, and I think if you really like take a time inventory of your day, you have time to cook. You just have to stop wasting time, say, on the phone or other things you may be doing, playing a game. Um, take a little bit of that time and cook for your family. Um, another thing would be like meal planning, like plan ahead on the weekends. Like, what are we going to have next week? And start small. Let's say I'm going to cook two nights. I'm going to cook two nights a week. Start there. Plan out. Get the groceries that you need. Have everything there so there's no excuses. And then just enjoy that. Enjoy that time of preparing food. Um, that can be another thing that's just good for your family, good for your soul and good for your health too. Okay. Steve, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? From New York. Uh, Stephen, when you said you had family that had this, I have a close friend that's going through this. He's in dialysis. He just had his leg amputated and that statistic that they said that the dialysis unit was going to be half empty in five years. What's the mortality for somebody that doesn't go plant-based? And what's the difference between if they make the lifestyle changes or they don't? Yes, Steve, th this is a really um, important question. You know, when when we look at patients who've been on dialysis, the longest patient I ever had on dialysis was he started in the 60s. He was one of the original folks that started on dialysis, and he was on it for, gosh, 40-some uh, years. And um, it was very, um, very difficult to see all of the different things that he had gone through because the, the technology wasn't as well. But the flip side to that argument was that without knowing what to do, he was doing so many of the things that we talk about today. There's no hard and fast statistics, but what we do know is that for folks who end up moving more, who are focusing on keeping their potassiums at bay, who have their phosphorus in range going on, whose blood pressures are controlled and whose volumes are controlled, 
on dialysis, think of dialysis every time you do that, that it kind of stuns the heart. When the machine is turned on, there's an entire unit of blood that's taken out of your body that's sitting in the machine throughout that whole three to four hours. So imagine if I was to let you bleed and then make you run a marathon. And then I had you do that marathon three times a week. And every time you ran the marathon, you were missing a unit of blood. That's a a very graphic way to describe how hemodialysis is occurring. But when it's occurring, you, you're sort of fighting. And so when you're going into a fight, you want to give yourself the best chance. So for your friend, what I would say is same stuff that matters is fluid control, fluid control, fluid control. You got to do that because the more the machine has to work to take the fluid out, the more it stresses the heart. Remember, it's a vacuum. It's sucking out blood and then it's using diffusion to get rid of the fluid out of there. So as you're get creating this more pressure and the machine is working harder, your heart is working harder. Take the pressure off the heart. People on dialysis, what ends up happening is, is the dialysis machine, we have a salt gradient. Everything that Jen and I just spoke about in terms of salt. Now think about a machine that's loaded with salt on one side, and we're using that to try to pull fluid out. And because we're using that, we can actually make it so that when you're done with dialysis, you're going to be intensely thirsty. So it's very common for a patient's post-dialysis to go home, be really thirsty, drink too much, come back to the machine, then the machine has to work extra hard. So this is where fluid, fluid, fluid matters. Blood pressure matters. If your blood pressure is not controlled, you got to control it. Phosphorus, remember, they're going to precipitate. It's going to light up like a Christmas tree. All your blood vessels are going to harden. You're going to run out of places to do dialysis because of the fact that the blood vessels are no good. Phosphorus matters. We have to control the phosphorus. And because the risk of arrhythmia on dialysis with high potassium is so high, we take it very, very seriously. Those are the fundamental things that are really key. And then everything that Jen has mentioned about the diet portion, about the fiber portion, all of those things are important because you're going to change the type of uremic toxins you're producing. You're going to decrease the production. So I couldn't give you any specific statistics, but what I can tell you is there are so many things that the person can do when they go on dialysis and when they're at home waiting to mm -hmm. go for the next session, the doctors and the dietitians play a very small role in advising. But at the end of the day, we can only give you the knowledge. You still got to walk through the door. I agree with that. If you think about in any, in any condition, any chronic condition, you're with your doctor what, 5% of the time? If you're a dialysis patient or with your doctor or your dietitians, maybe. 10% of the time, you're with yourself a lar a much larger percentage of time. I would tell you, go to your friend and encourage your friend to be activated in his care. Be his, he needs to be the number one team mate on the team. The number one, he needs to be the captain of the team. And, and so a lot of times people think in healthcare, well, it's my, my, my healthcare team out here is helping me. No, no, your friend is part of that team. He has got to fight for himself. Um, help the dialysis machine is what I tell patients. Help the dialysis machine. Don't come in here with so much fluid that the nurses are having to pull it off of you and the machine's warm. Help that machine. Come in here with less fluid. Help that machine. Be less acidic. Eat a more alkaline diet. Help that machine. Eat less phosphorus because the machine doesn't remove phosphorus very well anyway in, in center hemodialysis. So doing everything at home he can possibly do to be as healthy as he possibly can. Another thing that we haven't talked about, and Dr. Hashmi actually may have some really good suggestions on this as well, is, you know, there's different modalities that a patient can choose. Um, some of them have better survival rates. So your friend, in if he, I don't know what type of dialysis he's on, but if he's in in-center hemodialysis where he goes three times a week, there's also dialysis that you can do at home called peritoneal dialysis. It's a little bit easier on the heart. Um, there's home hemodialysis. So, um, and, and those sometimes you'll get better clearance than you will. You're, you'll get those toxins cleared out a little bit better depending on the patient and their situation. But sometimes they do a whole lot better that way. They may live longer on one of those other modalities. So that's another thing is just thinking about modality choice. Is he on the right type of dialysis? So. Okay, thank you. Joe, where are you from and would you like to ask a question? Yes, I'm from Huntington, Long Island. 
Um, have you ever encountered or heard of any patients that have had uh, tumors in their kidney that lived a plant-based lifestyle that exercised, were on a, a very, very good diet, um, and when they found out they had the tumor, there was a, there's absolutely uh, no kidney dysfunction other than um, a little bit of light blood in the morning. Um, is that mean that, that that kidney needs to be removed? Or have you ever heard that there's an opportunity if that kidney came there, it can go away? I mean, the uh, tumor. Yeah, so this is a really important question. The first thing you got to understand is, is oftentimes we'll see that tumors can even start as cysts. Now, after the age of 50, most people will have simple cysts in their kidney, so that's very common. But as cysts, the walls of the cysts start to thicken or you start to see lines through them. We call them septations. It starts to become very, very important Then we follow those. When you have a solid tumor, there are several techniques now. So in the old days, it was, yes, you got a tumor, you take the kidney out. Now, there's all sorts of things instead of just a radical nephrectomy, there can be a partial nephrectomy, they can go ahead and go in and ablate it going on. The reason you don't want to think of the idea of just ignoring it, at a minimum, your urologist may say things like, we're going to do serial scanning to see is it growing? Because what you don't want to do is have that kidney cell, the tumor cell, leave the kidney and go deposit somewhere else. And now you have metastatic disease. So whenever people have blood in the urine, it's really important, especially for men, because there's no reason why they should have blood in the urine. Most common source of blood in the urine is the prostate, but you need to have a cystoscopy. You need to have that evaluated. So if that's the case, it's really important. We have so many good therapies now when it comes to treating kidney cancer that it's a completely different field than it was just 10 years ago. So the one advice is, please do not ignore it. And if you're working with a um, urologist that maybe you know you don't see eye to eye, get a second opinion, get a third opinion, but do what you got to do. Because at the end of the day, you want a doctor that's going to listen to you and that's going to create a partnership with you. But please do not ignore it. Uh, Joe, anything else? Um, does um, Jen have any, uh, has she dealt with anything like that? Does, does it mean that the kidney has to come out if they see a tumor in there or is it possible? Um, I'm, I am doing sonograms and so far in, in over four weeks, I noticed that it stopped growing. So mm -hmm. from the CAT scan to the sonogram, it grew a couple of weeks and then four weeks later, the sonogram to the sonogram, it didn't grow anymore. And, and that was the four weeks that I was in intensive, really good intensive program of trying to stop it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't ever had a patient like with a tumor and in your exact situation, but I will say is that I have had many patients that the only change they made was nutrition. And we saw unbelievable results. No medication changes at all, just nutrition. Um, so, you know, if, if you're seeing results, continue on your program, work with your physician, um, and hopefully it won't have to come out. Okay. I mean, have you heard of tumors shrinking ever in kidneys? Um, more in like with people with polycystic kidney disease. Yes. I have heard of those tumors shrinking, the cyst shrinking, but that's a little bit different than a tumor. Okay, tumors typically don't shrink and, and, and go away, is what you're saying. I'm not 100% sure on that. Dr. Hashmi, do you know if tumors no, typically I mean, I, I, Yeah, so Joe, this is really important because, you know, part of this is, is there's a lot of modalities for treatment and diet plays such an important role in your overall health. But I, I want to emphasize that if you miss the opportunity to get early treatment, with one of the different modalities that we have. And it doesn't need to mean taking the kidney out. There are other modalities that can happen. But I want to stress, you, you want to pay very close attention because if a cancer cell metastasizes, that's a whole different ballpark that you have to deal with. And that's why whenever we have somebody with kidney cancer, 
at the end of the day, I always emphasize diet, but I can't stress this enough is, is you got to work with a very good urologist. That is absolutely critical to make sure you don't risk this thing getting out of hand. And one, congratulations, the fact that it's not growing, that's great. Number two is please work very, very closely with your urologist. This is critical to make sure you do that. Thank you. Right. And, you know, another thing is just uh, going back, we're back at Instagram again, but, you know, just urge caution, you know, my going back to my husband having cancer, you know, we got all, you'll get all sorts of people telling you, oh, if you just drink carrot juice, if you just do this or that, it's going to shrink that, that tumor and everything's going to be fine. Um, no, do not believe that. It's urging caution. I agree with Dr. Hashmi, get get with the doctor and make sure that you are following the appropriate protocol. Don't just follow something that you saw or heard um, about nutrition. Sometimes nutrition, yes, it can help. I have seen extreme wonderful things happen with just nutrition, but at the same time, sometimes nutritional advice from people who aren't qualified can be very dangerous because it will keep you from getting treatment that you should get um, in hopes that some sort of nutrition fab will fix your problem. And that may not be the case. Thank you. Okay. So I want to thank you both. Bob, if we want to follow up with either of you, um, Jen, how would we follow up with you? How do, what, 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 what's the best way to get your books, your information, your website? How do we stay in touch with you? I'm sorry, you're muted. Hold on. Hold on. Good. Okay, <laughs> sorry about again. that. Both of the books are on Amazon. If you are a patient, be sure to get the one that says for the patient. It's it's it says in red, big red for the patient. Um, you can catch me if you want to email me, Jen at plantfedwellness.com. I'm on Instagram, plantfed kidney, plantfed underscore kidneys. Um, and then my website is plantfedwellness.com. And Wait. my talk on May the 15th, I have all of that on there as well. So you can catch me. I still have another presentation coming up in this in this um, series. So I hope all of you will be there um, and we can talk further. We can talk even more about the subject. And if someone wants a consultation with you, do you do phone consultations or Zoom consultations? I do. Yes, I do. I, um, I have a virtual practice. So yes, I can meet with people one on one. Okay. I also have, here's another thing. This is really important. I should have said this. This is on my website, plantfedwellness.com. And I did this for, for this very reason. Sometimes it's really sad that nutritional care is not covered by insurance a whole lot of the time. Okay. Um, sometimes people can't afford it. And I realized that. And I made a program the book will help you, but I also did a program that's very affordable. It's an eight module program. I teach all eight modules. Um, you can find that on my website, um, but it's for you. It's for you. Oh, here we go. Yes. It's for you. If you don't, if you don't have insurance that covers nutrition, you can't afford it and you feel hopeless. That's there for you. Okay. So you need, you need a dietitian, you need help. Um, and I want to help people in every way that I can, because it bothers me very much. This is my life's work. It bothers me when people don't get help and they just fall forward to dialysis. That's not fair. Um, and, and you deserve the best treatment possible. So yes, there's and, the eight, eight week fundamentals right there. So, yep. And uh, Jen is going to be speaking on Monday, May 15th at 11 AM to give her individual lecture for people that would like to uh, hear her speak again and see her full presentation. Uh, Dr. Hashmi, would you? How do people get in touch with you? Can we speak to you by Zoom? What's the best way to follow up with you? Yeah, so there are uh, two YouTube channels. This is the first one, which is uh, Self Principle, S E L F, and the other one is Plant Based Kidney Health, where myself and Michelle Crossmer, who's a renal dietitian, we basically answer people's questions, whatever questions they are about kidney health, and we collect those. So those are the two YouTube channels. The website is selfprinciple.org. That's a nonprofit that we have, where um, the goal there is is really to support children's education and to uh, create content that's educational for everyone going on. So those are the best ways to get a hold of me. If you're on Instagram, it's just my name, Sean Hashmi MD. And uh, it would be great. I would love to connect. Thank you. And, and you have, it looks like 235 videos on kidney health on your YouTube channel. Uh, there, there's quite a bit. <laughs> I don't know how many, but there, there's a, a decent amount. So 
It's uh, all sorts of topics on this one in terms of nutrition and kidney health. And then the plant-based kidney health channel is specific for just kidney topics. Okay, so this was fantastic. Uh, this information is not easy to find. I don't know why it's not easy to find, but I really glued to this. I heard a lot of stuff I never heard. Uh, if we could unmute everyone, I'm, I wanna thank you. And I think other people would also wanna thank you for the opportunity to hear this information. So we all wanna thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. 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 Thank you.